Good afternoon. My name is Max Parker. I'm president of the Board of Trustees of St. Angelo Independent Dis School District, and I want to welcome you to our uh, agenda meeting tonight. Um, I want to um, welcome all that are watching this also on our Access Channel, Channel 4. And we appreciate all of you, whether you're here or whether you're on television with your interest in our students. All the items that we're going to discuss at our meeting tonight have been posted as required by state law. Also, as you may be aware, our board meets a minimum of two times per month, and most, if not all, the items on our agenda this evening were previous, previously discussed at our earlier pre-agenda board workshop last Monday. As members of the SAISD Board of Trustees, we are here to set goals, listen to reports from our superintendent, approve budgets, contracts, and personnel appointments, and to make policy for the district. Please keep in mind that our meeting is a meeting of the Board of Trustees held in public and not a meeting of the public. However, with that in mind, we have an item on every one of our meeting agendas that allows anyone present who wishes to speak to our board team an opportunity to do so. Additionally, prior to taking any votes, I will ask audience members if they would like to make any comments. Anyone wishing to make comments on any agenda item should do their best to limit their comments to five minutes or less. Also, if you're here to speak on something that's not on our agenda, please keep in mind that our board team cannot reply except to say thank you for your comments. In compliance with state law, these proceedings are recorded and will become a part of SAISD's permanent legal record. In order that the recording will adequately reflect the proceedings, I ask that you please refrain from talking while others are speaking. I also ask, as I remind my fellow board members, to please turn off or silence your cell phones now. Again, it's my pleasure to welcome you to tonight's meeting and thank you for taking time to join us. We appreciate your interest in the activities of our students and the business of our district. Uh, we have our full board team here, so we have a quorum. I appreciate all the board members being present. At this time, I'm going to ask Joel Moore, senior pastor of Fresh, for, excuse me, First Presbyterian Church, to lead us in our invocation. Thank you. Let us pray. Gracious Lord, we come before you this evening to praise your name and to ask for your blessings. For you are a God who desires for all people to walk in the light of your truth. You are a God who delights in wisdom and knowledge. You are a God who grants wisdom and knowledge to those who ask it from you. You are a God who commands that the way be made clear for children to learn and grow and flourish with the gifts that you've bestowed on them. You are a God who instructs parents to provide for and to nourish and to protect those entrusted to their care. And you are a God who encourages communities to come together to read and to write and to sing and to play and to educate and to pray all for our good and all for your glory. Knowing these things about you and knowing that we need your help, we ask that you will guide the school board of San Angelo Independent School District tonight as they meet. We pray for board president Max Parker. We pray for vice president Bill Bendel. We pray for secretary Gerard Gallegos. We pray for treasurer Dr. Taylor Kingman. We pray for Lupita Arroyo. We pray for Lanny Lehman. And we pray for Amy Mazel Flint. We pray for Superintendent Dr. Carl Detloff. We pray for welcome guests and concerned citizens present. Let their conversations tonight be open and forthright. Let their discussions be tempered with grace. Let their debates seek consensus. Let their disagreements be civil. And in all things, let us continue to treat each other as we ourselves would want to be treated. Lord, we would be remiss if we failed to lift up the very people that we are trying to serve here tonight. Therefore, we pray for the teachers and the staff and the administrators of our schools. We pray for the families of our students, and we pray especially for our students. Let our decisions made here tonight focus on the goal to educate and train our children to be faithful and productive members of our community to everyone's benefit and to your glory. 
the name of Jesus, who knows what it's like to be a child, we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Moore, for taking time to be with us, and thank you for that prayer. Appreciate it. I will now ask some of our um, outstanding elementary students at Alta Loma Elementary to come forward, Ali Garcia, fifth grader, Sean Laura, fourth grader, Alexis Kessler, fourth grader, Ronnie Rios, fifth grader, Jackson Rios, fifth grader, and then ask all of you to stand. They're going to lead us to the Pledge of Allegiance to the United States flag and to the Texas flag. I told the students to stay up here for any parents or any administrator that want to take photos. Okay. All right, let's give them a big hand. Thanks again, guys. All right, I'm going to I'm going to turn things now over to is it Rodney Chet? Rodney, you're going to come forward, our um, athletic director for San Angelo Independent School Districts for recognitions. Thank you, Mr. Parker, board members, uh, Dr. Dethloff. Um, before I bring in our, our first group, I uh, just want to give you a real quick report. We just got finished uh, running our 63rd San Angelo relays. Um, 1,300 athletes from across the state came in, um, 81 teams. It was a rousing success thanks to, uh, thanks to our, our volunteers, to our coaches, to the community, um, and we're certainly looking forward to having another great year next year. Um, first group that we're going to bring in is uh, the Lakeview Powerlifting team, Coach Mejia. Uh, if you want to go in and bring in your team, please, sir. Good afternoon. Um, I'm Coach Mejia. This is Coach uh, Sergio Plata. He's my assistant, and uh, we're the we're the coaches for the powerlifting team. Um, we'd like to thank for uh, thank you guys for uh, inviting us to be recognized, or the, the our powerlifters to be recognized. We'd like to thank the school board, our administration, our coordinator Hector, and special thanks. I don't know if Julie and Jessica's in here. If they're not, them ladies do everything, and I'm so happy that they take care of us. I wanted to give them a special, a special thanks for keeping us right, going the right way. Um, this, this, this year, uh, we were blessed, again, to have a, 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 big, a big team. Um, we were so big that we'd have to alternate on who would get to go and compete at, at the powerlifting meets that we did attend. Um, this year, uh, the kids did really well. They, they pushed. They, they pushed themselves. Um, this year, this is not all the girls. We have girls missing some. One of them's learning how to drive. One of them's sick. One of them's at a, at a college right now. So we have some that aren't here. But uh, 11 of the girls qualified, the whole team qualified to go to regionals this year. So I'd like to give a big old <laughs> clap for that. And uh, I'll, I'll call out the girls that are here. Um, Brianna Vieda. Brooke Skelton, Amari Calhoun, 
Sophie Gottel, Adrian Bankston, Delilah Davis, and uh, Malia Briones. The, these young ladies worked really hard, and, and throughout, the, throughout the season, they set goals, and then they would surpass them on a week-to-week-to-week -to -week -to -week basis. Um, Ulyssa isn't here. She's one of the ones that uh, uh, is on a school trip today. Um, but these guys, uh, if, if I could give you the numbers, and I can, but I'm not going to because it'd take a long time. Um, these ladies, you know, at the beginning of the year, had a, had a certain total, and like I said, every week to week to week that we'd go compete, they, they, just, they just surpassed them, and they did a wonderful job. I've, I've never had 11 girls make it to, to regional, and it was an honor, and it was, it was, I was really, really proud of them, their teamwork. Um, Ms. Vega is not here. That she was our state qualifier. Um, and and this, just a quick uh, story about her. We had already competed. We were eating, and I had texted the regional director, and I asked, I said, hey, I said, Fred, before I cancel my state rooms, are you sure that we didn't make it? And the regional director texts me back, and he goes, Coach, don't cancel. Ulyssa made it. And she's not here, but that's a story about our state qualifier. She had actually come, she had surpassed the total she needed to actually qualify to go to um, the state and compete in Corpus. And while she was there, uh, she lifted the, on, two, on, two, on the bench and the squat. She, she, she actually had her best meet, you know, and, and that's all you can ask for these guys. But uh, that's, that's, that was our girls. And now I'll talk to the boys. Um, I have Juan Ortiz, Alex Alcantar, John Cepeda, Willie Rodriguez, and Isaac Cordova. Um, all these boys also, the same as the girls, they worked really hard. Um, they're, a true, they're the true meaning of, of student athlete, this whole group. Because, you know, you have to get the grades to pass, and you have to, you have to pass to play, pass to lift. And, and they did a super job throughout the year. Um, all the boys that you see in front also surpassed. They got stronger and stronger, uh, and they lived in the weight room after school. Um, after school, when we, when we first started, we had 62, 62 kids in our weight room every day. And I'm talking for three months at a time. So I was really proud of that. Um, Juan, uh, the young man with the cap, um, he placed second. He placed second. This, this was also Juan's third year to be a regional qualifier. He had actually qualified since he was a, a freshman. Um, he, he, he got second at the regional tournament. And uh, he, while at the, at the uh, state tournament, excuse me, the state meet in Abilene, on his, on his squat, he squatted uh, 670, 670 pounds. And that's, uh, that demolished um, the school record by 50 pounds. It's been there for 20 years. So I'm really, I'm really proud for that. As, as, as well as it, him competing at the, at the state meet, um, coming to the third, the third lift, uh, Juan was behind, sitting in ninth, and he started on his deadlift, and I just saw he closed the gap huge. And he actually, he, he actually got fifth, but due to his weight and, the, and, the, and his the guy he was competing against weighed less, so he got etched out of fifth and actually received a medal. But um, I'm super proud, and I thank you for your parents for letting me have your kids. Okay, I, I really appreciate it, and I appreciate all the support from the school board and my administration, and Julie and, and Jessica, if you're not here, I'll be sure to say thank you again. Mm -hmm. But uh, that was our 2022 year. Thank you.
Thank you, Coach Mejia. As they leave, um, I'd like to bring in the uh, Bobcat powerlifting team led by Coach Krim. Good evening. Uh, just want to thank the board and uh, Dr. Detloff for having us out tonight uh, to recognize our great season that we had. Um, tonight we have uh, junior Nicholas Perez, uh, senior Caleb Russell. Those are our boys that made the, uh, <coughs> the boys uh, regional powerlifting meet. As the girls' side, we had seven girls uh, advance to regionals, which is the most, uh, you know, since I've been doing this, that I've ever had, which was great. Uh, we had senior Rebecca Dupree. Uh, she was first team All-State academic as well. We had sophomore Jalen De Hoyos. Uh, we had senior Daniela Valdez. Freshman Ava Gutierrez. Senior Marissa Luna. Freshman Emmy Graham. And freshman Kira Parker. Uh, also, we had Jalen De Hoyos was a state qualifier, uh, went to the state powerlifting meet in uh, Corpus Christi, and she play, placed ninth there. Um, and Daniela Valdez, who is not here tonight, she's at the powerlifting meet in Nationals in Chicago right now competing. Uh, she was a state champion in her weight class, so that was very big time for us, and she was also second team uh, academic all-state. So just one more time, I want to congratulate each of you guys uh, on a great season uh, and looking forward to uh, watching you seniors go off and do great things. And um, you underclassmen, we got, we got next year, so we got to get going. Your assistant coach. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes. Sorry, coach. Uh, our assistant coach was uh, Coach Romario Napolis, who was also a Central alum. So uh, he helped out tremendously this year. All right, thank you guys. Thanks for having us tonight. Thank you, Coach Cram. <laughs> Next up, we have the uh, Lady Bobcats basketball team led by Jordan Sarden. All right, thank you all so much for having us. Uh, you know, we had a really great season this year. We finished uh, 23 and 12. We are eight and four in district. Um, we ended up getting third place and went on to the bi-district round. We lost by one point right at the end, um, but it was a really phenomenal season. Super proud of our five seniors. We had amazing leadership from all five of them. Uh, not everyone on our team could be here, um, but the ones that are here, I just want to kind of 
uh, talk about them and, and let you all know what their accolades were this year. Uh, so our first one is junior Alyssa Barone, and she received second team all district this year. Next is Jules Perez. She received first team all district, academic all district, and then she received our team defensive MVP. Our next one is senior Peyton Mayberry. She received honorable mention, academic all district. She received the Hollins Award for our team, and then also THSCA academic all state honorable mention. Our next one is senior Delaney Hester. She received second team all district, academic all district. She got our team fighting heart award and also THSCA academic all state honorable mention. Next we have sophomore Nevaeh Hearn. She received honorable mention and academic all district. We have senior Michaela Salazar who received second team all district. Next we have Anna Wurzawiski. She received honorable mention. Next, we have freshman Regan Howell. Uh, then we have sophomore Sydney Moore, who received honorable mention in academic all district. Next, we have our senior Deandra Allen, who received first team all district and our team MVP award. And then lastly, we have Kiara and Jamanzi. Um, and these are just amazing women, super proud of all that they have accomplished this year. So thank you all again for having us. Thank you, Coach Harden. Congratulations, ladies, on a great, fantastic year. Next, from Central, we have the Bobcat boys basketball team, led by C.J. Viegas. Uh, first of all, thank you. Uh, we'd like to say uh, thank you to Dr. Deathloff, uh, the school board and administrative, uh, Mr. Waters and our CHS administration team uh, at the school, our athletic administration as well with Coach Chant uh, and, his, and uh, the individuals in his office uh, for the continued support. Uh, throughout these last two years. So uh, this is your varsity boys basketball team. Uh, we do have a few members that are not with us tonight uh, due to some other uh, circumstances that they were uh, involved with. So, uh, But I'm just going to introduce uh, the gentleman that we have in front of us. Uh, and then I'll also give a, a few of their individual awards. Um, finish the season 21 and 11, uh, some team awards. Finish the season 21 and 11. Uh, we um, won the Doug McCutcheon uh, tournament, so we were champions of that. Uh, which was awesome and a, a great uh, accomplishment for these young men. Uh, we finished third place in the Leander Classic uh, the following weekend. Um, we were able to uh, clinch a, a playoff uh, spot, uh, uh, fourth place, and uh, we ended up losing in the first round uh, by district round to El Paso America. So uh, super proud of these young men, like I said. But we'll start off senior, Chase Fields. Uh, Chase Fields is a first team, uh, yeah, excuse, excuse me, first team all district. Um, he is a TABC uh, academic all state. He is uh, academic uh, all district. 
He is also a THSCA academic all state, so uh, Chase Fields. <laughs> Matthew Cooper. Uh, Matthew Cooper is a second team all district. He will be a TABC uh, academic all state, and he is also announced to the THSCA academic all state. Matthew Cooper. We have Dominic Ruiz, who's uh, next. Uh, Dom is a senior as well. Uh, Dom was um, named to the THSCA Academic All-State. He was also Academic All-District. We have Mark Holloman, senior. We have Samuel Ramos, senior. Next to Samuel, we have Raven Ortiz. Raven Ortiz is a first-team All-District. Uh, player for us. Jaden Gibson. Jaden Gibson is a junior. Next to Raven is Jaden Gibson, who's a junior. Uh, Jaden Gibson received honorable mention all district. We have Art Vasquez, who's next. Uh, Carlos LeBron, another senior. And Jaden Sellers, another senior. Like I said, that right there concludes uh, our CHS uh, boys uh, varsity basketball team. Um, like I said, we're, we were senior heavy this year, uh, so we're going to miss a lot of those guys uh, next year. Uh, but they're a big part of, um, you know, what was accomplished this season. And, uh, you know, I'm building and, and looking forward towards the future. So uh, those guys are, have set the bar really high, so super proud of them. But uh, like I said, I would just like to reiterate, uh, you know, the, our appreciation uh, for our administration. Uh, and what they do for our student athletes. Uh, so thank you all. Thank you, Coach Viegas. Congratulations, gentlemen, on a fantastic season. <laughs> Next, we've got uh, Coach McLaughlin, who's going to be introducing the Lady Cat swim team. First off, I'd like to thank Dr. Detloff and the SISD board members and Coach Chance for having us here uh, today. We appreciate all the support that you have given Central Swimming uh, this year. Uh, I've also wanted to thank Mr. Waters and the CHS administration for their continued support and Coach Corbett and the CHS athletic training staff uh, for all their help in keeping our athletes healthy and rehabilitating them so they're able to stay in the water. Uh, this year, our girls' team uh, season was filled with many successes. We placed first in the team uh, standings in the Midland Invitational, the Abilene Invitational, uh, and the Abilene Invitational. We placed second at our home meet, the San Angelo Invitational. Our girls won the District 26A title this year uh, after finishing second the last two years, which is our ninth title in uh, 12 years. We qualified 18 girls to regionals set, and set three new school records. Uh, starting off, we have Zoe Moore. Uh, she was a regional finalist in the Forner Freestyle Relay, honorable mention all region and first team all district. Zoe Moore. 
Next, we have Mallory Manning. She is a regional finalist in the 200 free and 400 free saw relay and consol consolation finalist, uh, regional finalist in the 100 butterfly. She was honorable mention all region and first team all district. Mallory Manning. Next it would be Salma Hernandez. Salma was a regional finalist in the 400 freestyle relay, uh, honorable mention all region and second team all district. Salma Hernandez. Uh, Sophia Blastic, uh, she was a regional consolation finalist in the 100 breaststroke and first team all district. Sophia Blastic. Emma Watkins was a regional finalist in the 200 medley and 200 freestyle re relay and con regional consolation finalist in the 200 freestyle and 100 butterfly. She was second team all region and first team all district. Emma Watkins. Uh, Camila Acevedo. She was a regional finalist in the 200 medley relay and 100 breaststroke. She was uh, second team all region and first team all district. Camila Acevedo. And then finishing up our sophomores would be Paula Brame. Paula was a uh, regional finalist in the 200 medley relay and 200 freestyle relay, uh, ending up second team all region and first team all district. Paula Brame. Our junior uh, represented tonight, uh, uh, Whitney Edinburgh. She was regional finalist in the 200 medley relay and 200 freestyle relay and 100 uh, butterfly. Regional Constellation finalist in the 100 backstroke. She was second team all region, first team all district, and academic all state. Uh, she also has five school records, uh, Whitney Edinburgh. <laughs> Caitlin Migrants is one of our two seniors this year, uh, was a regional finalist in the 400 freestyle relay and honorable mention, uh, which had her uh, honorable mention all region and first team all district, Caitlin Migrants. Uh, and our last senior, uh, Holly Harrington, was a regional qualifier in the 200 free and 500 freestyle. She was first team all district and academic all state and academic all American. Holly Harrington. Uh, these girls did a great job this year, and we look forward to, uh, we only graduate two, so we get all, almost all of them back, so it's going to be another great year next year. This is our girls' varsity swim team. Oh, oh, sorry. Also, I'd like to thank my assistant, uh, Megan Ferris, my sister. We couldn't do uh, the job that we do uh, every day without her, all the help that uh, she provides the, the swimmers and me. Uh, it's a good assistant, great assistant. <laughs> <laughs> I, just, I got I got a tunnel. I got a tunnel. <laughs> Parents, you guys are welcome to come as close as you want to get that close up. No big deal. <laughs> come on forward. Congratulations, ladies. Next, Coach McLaughlin will be introducing the Bobcat swim team.
I'd like to start by thanking my assistant coach uh, for help, helping, helping with the boys' swim team. Um, <laughs> uh, another great year for the Bobcat swim team. Uh, here are some of our highlights. Uh, we placed first at the Midland, Abilene, and San Angelo Invitational. Our boys won the District 26A uh, team title for the 12th consecutive year. We had 14 boys qualify to regionals, one boy qualify to state. We've set two school records, we set two pool records, and one district record. Uh, so it was a, an amazing year, a great year for us. Uh, and uh, today we have our seniors and regional finalists uh, representing the swim team. <laughs> Starting off, we have uh, Sophomore Luis Trevino Tovas, he was a regional, uh, regional consolation finalist in the 400 freestyle relay and was first team all district. Luis Tovas. <laughs> Next we have sophomore Earl Childs. Uh, Earl was a regional finalist in the 200 medley relay and regional consolation finalist in the 400 freestyle relay. He was second team all region and first team all district, Earl Childs. Next would be uh, sophomore Tristan Thompson. He was a regional consolation finalist in the 100 backstroke and was second team all district. Tristan Thompson. <laughs> Next would be uh, junior Creed Thompson. He was a regional consolation finalist in the 100 butterfly and 400 freestyle relay. He was first team all district and academic all state. Creed Thompson. <laughs> Starting off our seniors, uh, Samuel Helm was a regional finalist in the 100 backstroke, 200 medley, and 200 freestyle relays. He was regional consolation finalist in the 50 freestyle. He was first team all region, first team all district, academic all state, and academic all American. Uh, Samuel Helm. Uh, next senior would be Caleb Peacock. He was regional finalist in the 200 freestyle relay, regional consolation finalist in the 400 freestyle relay. He was first team all region, first team all district, academic all state, and academic all American. Caleb Peacock. Our <laughs> uh, last senior for the night would be Cody Fentress. He was state qualifier in the 200 freestyle. Uh, 200 freestyle. He was regional finalist in the 100 freestyle. 200 medley and 200 freestyle relays. He's first team all region, first team all district, academic all state and academic all American. And he uh, set two school records this year, Cody Ventress. Uh, thank you again for all your support. We are always working to get better and faster. We currently have 200 swimmers in our program, 70 in uh, the high school teams between varsity and JV, another 60 to 70 on our middle school program, and another 50 to 60 in our after school uh, program. So thank you for your continued support.
All right, I think uh, I didn't see Coach Chant. Did he leave? If he did, then we're ready to move forward. Then I'm going to now uh, bring forward uh, Whitney Wood, Executive Director of Communications, and Molly Turk, Director of Community Relations, for some more recognitions. Good evening, Mr. Parker and distinguished members of the board. Following those exciting athletes, we have another opportunity to celebrate yet another way at SAISD, our students are smart. It is my honor and privilege to introduce you to Central High School senior Ariane Shake, who exemplifies the attributes of the SAISD learner profile. San Angelo ISD and Central High School proudly celebrate Ariane for many reasons and most recently, for being named a candidate in the prestigious 2022 U.S. Presidential Scholars Program. He is one of only 163 in the entire state, one of three in West Texas, and that's when we're being liberal because the other two are, I really think, in the panhandle with Amarillo and Idaloo. Um, <laughs> And then Ariane joins more than 5,000 scholars candidates nationwide selected from the nearly 3.6 million students expected to graduate from U.S. high schools in 2022. Inclusion in the program is one of the highest honors bestowed upon graduating high school seniors nationally. Ariane and fellow scholar candidates are selected on the basis of superior academic and artistic achievements, leadership qualities, strong character and involvement in community and school activities. To tell you a little more about Ariane, he is currently balancing an intense course load at Central of college boarded AP courses and dual credit courses. He scored exceptionally high on his SATs and ACT tests. He is highly active and passionate about UIL academics, both individual and team, earning awards in math and science, like first place overall in science, top chemistry, and top physics scores, and most recently in an academic meet in Abilene, placing first in two categories. He also holds the office of president for the Central Chapter of the National Honor Society and was a member of the Central High School varsity tennis team his freshman through junior year. At this time, I'd like you all to have the opportunity to hear directly from this amazing young man, Ariane, if you can come up here. And then I'm going to ask him to just kind of share why you think what's helped you be successful and kind of what your future plans are. And then if you all want to ask him a few questions. Uh, thank you, Ms. Wood, for the in introduction. Um, I think SAISD has played a very large role in my success as a student and as a person. Um, I think just the amazing teachers, administrators, and counselors at SAISD, starting from my elementary school to middle school through high school, has just played a great role in my academic su success. Um, all my teachers and all of my AP and dual credit classes have just really helped me uh, grow as a student. Um, taking the time you know, to stay during lunch and after school is never easy on anyone, especially a student. Um, but I really thank all of my teachers over my 12 years here in SAISD. Um, and I, overall, I, I just thank SAISD and its um, amazing school board for all the support they give to their students. and. Um, yeah, just thank you and uh, for contributing to my education and all the uh, students um, who are part of SAISD. So thank you. And um, I believe uh, I plan on going to a, uh, Texas, a public Texas university here in, um, uh, here in Texas, and I hope to major in a biology or a biomedical science. And we just wanted you to have the opportunity to meet this outstanding young man. And we are so proud. And his parents are here with us tonight, too. I'm sure y'all are very proud as well. Um, and Dr. Detloff, if this time, can I have you come down for a picture if we can? Let's see. Oh, my microphone is working. I'm also looking for a candidate for the 2040 presidential election. <laughs> and I think I may have found him. Take an individual and then.
wait, wait. Can't wait to see it with this class of 2022 and Ariane and everything they do in the future and what the future holds for y'all. So congratulations. We're so proud of him. Okay, moving on. Um, Mr. Parker and members of the board, it is my pleasure to continue the celebrations of our students and the culmination of their hard work. Tonight, we have a special opportunity to recognize both some of our student athletes as well as their sponsor's leadership, a leader who embodies the characteristics of an SAISD difference maker, Coach Matt Eskew, and the national champion Central High School cheer team. Before Coach Eskew joins us to tell you more about this amazing group of athletes and their success this year, I want to note that Coach Eskew was named the Class 5A, 6A Cheerleading Coach of the Year by the Texas Girls Coaches Association. <laughs> Not only is this a winning team of athletes, but also of coaches. Thank you, Coach Eskew and Coach Morgan, for developing the talent to help our students achieve their dreams. Without further ado, I now pass it over to Coach Eskew and Coach Morgan to tell you more about this championship team. So these are our uh, Central High School cheerleaders and mascots for this year. Um, like she had said, they were the state or the sorry the national champions this year. That was their sixth overall title at NCA. Um, three in the last four years, and the only and that one year we finished second. Uh, this year, starting, we had um, great success in uh, November at UCA Regionals, where we won. And then we went on to NCA State, where we had the highest score in the game day division of any division, so all of the 1As through 6As and the co-eds. Then at UIL this year, we won um, Fight Song for 6A and had the highest Fight Song score of any division at UIL. And then at Nationals, out of a possible 100, they had a total score of 98.75, which was the highest score also of any division for game day. So... And then our mascots compete at NCA State, and they went 1-2 at that competition. So that was great success for them also. And we'd just like to take the opportunity to thank the board and also the administration here at SAISD and at Central High School for all your support, because that's one of the reasons we are successful. Congratulations, ladies. If we can have y'all go around so Whit they can shake Whitney, their hands. Oh. As, they, as they come around, would you, each one of them just give them the microphone so they can all announce their names? So we'll, oh. Okay. Yeah. Unless, unless Matt thinks he can go through every one of them. <laughs> I have it. No. Okay. Uh, well, then do it. Yeah. Just call out their names. Yeah. So y'all come over here. Use, use the microphone. As I read your name, you just go, how's that? Kendall Banks. <laughs> Ella Burns. 
Kaylin Cad, Lexi Casillas, Chance Bailey Collins, Daniela Dela Cruz, Carly Denson, Sydney Edgar, Kylie Fuchs, Ainsley Harper, Mariel Hartsky, Bailey Jowers, Junie Kim, Kendis Leach, Ava Lewis, Kylie Mikowski, Ava McKee, Caitlin Migrants, McKinley Nile, Kaylee Roeder, Jaden Sawyer, Caroline Still, Mariah Tibbs, Cameron Torres, Madison Vogel, Freddie Von Rosenberg, Lauren Ward, Lucy Wenzel. Such a fun energy when we have all our students here. Are y'all ready? Y'all ready for our next recognition? Okay. Our next recognition highlights the district's commitment to efficiency, specifically in use of our facilities and resources. Representatives from San Angelo ISD's partner in energy conservation and efficiency, Synergistic, will share exciting news about Environmental Protection Agency Energy Star certification for San Angelo ISD buildings and what that means for the district, our schools, and our community. I understand that the strategic work of the district together with Synergistic results in enough kilowatt savings per year to run our Central High School main campus, Central High School on Oaks, and Lakeview High School campus for an entire year. What an accomplishment and critical savings of funds. At this time, Synergistic Energy Specialist Robert Rumpf will join us to share more about the EPA Energy Star Awards, and I think Steve Van Hoosier is here. There. Sorry. 
<laughs> um, and they're going to tell us more about the Energy Star Wars and energy conservation. Thank you, Whitney. That's a prestigious group to follow. Sorry you have to end with us. But uh, Steve and I really appreciate the opportunity for Synergistic to come and present Energy Star Awards to all of the grade level campuses in the district. We do have a guest with us tonight, Mr. Ashton Whitley. Ashton is representing the Home Office in Dallas. He began as an energy specialist in Fort Worth ISD, which is also a Synergistic client. He's moved up and become a client manager. So he serves San Angelo ISD and several districts in this part of the country. So thanks for making the trip from the Metroplex Ashton. Uh, Steve and I would like to bring up three points that will help tie in just how Energy Star, Synergistic, and SAISD are related. First, with Synergistic, our goals haven't changed. We want to provide the students and the staff with the energy they need in a comfortable environment to help the district save money on their utility bills and to oversee an energy conservation program. As a result of that, since 2014, your cost avoidance and savings to date is, is about 7.3 million, just over that. Now, a data point that Steve and I like a little better, because it's a more apples to apples comparison, is what we call the energy use index. Sometimes it's called energy use intensity, and that's a measure of your energy use per square foot. KBTU is a unit of energy. The higher the score, the worse you are, the lower the score, the better. In 2014, that was the score for SAISD, 52.9. Currently, it's 31.8. That is a 40% reduction district-wide in your energy use per square foot. The average in the United States for schools is 48.5. So you started above average, now you're way below average. A practical application of that for SAISD is your electric use, because that's approximately 70% of your utility bills. So we took your average annual savings or decrease in usage per kilowatt hours. Not that gas and water aren't important, but we averaged five years together, we threw out COVID. So the district is now using or saving 8.7 kilowatts of electricity per year. You started using over 26 million, now the district averages just under 17.5. Keep in mind that you've added additional units, your tennis centers, Glen, Fort Concho, as well as your elementary gyms. So you've added AC, but you're still using less. And as Whitney said, it's actually more than just the, the schools. If you take in 2021, the kilowatt usage of every 612 campus, add district admin, they used about 8.2 million kilowatts. Essentially, you can throw in a couple elementary schools for good measure. You're getting all those campuses for free. And our goal is to maintain that so that it doesn't creep back up and you're having to pay for electricity that you formerly got for free. And the way we do that, of course, is to monitor online, to be in your schools, and Steve and I are available seven days a week, uh, and we often do that. And then the third reason, and this is where Energy Star comes in, the most important is to involve the staff in energy conservation. And we want to brag on the staff for just a moment because uh, Synergistic has over 100 clients coast to coast, but we put up energy conservation by the SA, SAISD staff against anyone. Uh, be, and here's an example. Steve and I, spring break, as we do every holiday, we walk every building, we go into every room, we walk into 1,500 classrooms to check and see if the staff did what we asked them to do for compliance, turning everything off, shutting everything down. 98% of the rooms were perfect. The other 2% just had maybe one minor item. Maybe they left their monitor on. We can get really picky because the staff is really good. And Energy Star wants to recognize that for campuses that run efficiently as far as energy goes. And the way to qualify for Energy Star, number one, you have to be better than 75% of your peer campuses. Every score for SAISD was in the 80s. Most of them were in the 90s. And the second part of getting Energy Star, it has, your data has to be confirmed by a third party. And that's where Synergistic comes in. Steve and I last year went to every campus we collected data from CO2 to lighting to temps 
to enrollment, square feet, all that. We submitted a stack of paperwork like this, about this thick, electronically to Synergistic, uh, and their engineers verified the data. They made sure that it was accurate, and then they submitted that application to the EPA on your behalf. Uh, they've done this for over 13,000 clients for 13 years, and it came back. This is the second time, by the way, in a row that all of your grade level campuses were awarded the Energy Star. So we just want to say thank you to the campuses and congratulations. I want to thank Mr. Whitley for making the, the trip again. Uh, Steve and I really do value the partnership that Synergistic has with SAISD. We enjoy every month when we enter all the utility bills, uh, seeing how much the district saves. But I think what we enjoy the most, well, I know what we enjoy the most is going to the campuses because uh, this is where we live. San Angelo is our home. We have a lot of love and respect for San Angelo SD as former employees. So we enjoy going to the campuses and getting to meet people and helping them and serve them with their AC needs any way uh, that they ask. So again, thank you for your time and congratulations. Oh, I will say, forgot to mention, in addition to the certificate and the little Energy Star uh, logo that they can put next to their 2017 one, it was delayed a year because of COVID. It should have been 2020. A Synergistic also provided these little glass, what do we call these? Plaques. Plaques. Thank you. And we'll make sure that we get these to the campuses. Thank you very much. Steve, anything we need to add? Thank you for being here, Mr. Whitley. Good seeing you, Steve. You... See you later. All right, I'll turn it over now to Dr. Gomez. Okay, so that means, Mr. Wilcox, you have to come out from the back. Okay, he's giving me the hand signal. So, Mr. Parker, Dr. Detloff, and members of the board, it is my great pleasure to recognize the smartness of a special team this evening. Our SISD communications team, including communications specialist Jack Wilcox, he'll join us when he can, Director of Community Relations, Molly Johnson-Turk. So, Molly, that means you, too, get to come on up. And Executive Director, Whitney Watson-Wood, we're honored with multiple awards by the Texas School Public Relations Association, or TSPRA, at the annual conference on February 23rd, 2022, including, and I need to correct this as Jack is coming up because attention to detail is important. I learned six gold stars, not five gold stars, as I originally told you, and a crystal, crystal certificate of merit. So in terms of gold star, to receive the gold star, not only does this submission achieve its purpose with noticeable creativity, craft, and skill, but in the opinion of the judges, it does so in an exceptional way. So submissions could include print, video, or electronic. I'm just going to tell you some of these gold stars because I think you'll recognize these because you've seen this work in SAISD. So specifically... The San Angelo Reads logo was a gold star for the trademark symbol. The San Angelo A to Z category video documentary received a gold star. The Thank You Principles National Principles Month in 2020 under the category for video promotional. Our People Make the Difference was Sean Godfrey, one of our nurses that we did 
last spring in the video marketing received a gold star. And this one with great acting. As we know, the do's and don'ts for wearing face mask. And the category for video training instructional received a gold star. Also, proper hand washing techniques. The category video training received a gold star. And it's very important to point out in the categories, there can only be one overall crystal award winner, only one. There's three different levels. And I want to make sure I did not ask the real experts here. So we competed in the less than 15,000, correct, communications team? Yes? Sort of. Oh, not in crystal. Okay, well, we won't go into those details. Well, But you can only have one winner, that I know. So one winner is a big task. We did receive from the smartness of this team right here, for the San Angelo ISD video portfolio, we received what's called a crystal commendation entry. When you can only have one overall winner, the judges give this to anyone they feel is a worthy runner-up. So for the entry of the video portfolio that they submitted. So I could go on. These are all the others. These are just the gold stars and that high crystal certificate of merit. So tonight we appreciate Jack, Molly, and Whitney's outstanding work in helping to tell the stories of our students and educators, as well as shining a light on the great things going on in SAISD. This team is usually behind the scene highlighting the gifts and talents of our students and staff, but tonight we recognize all the ways they are smart. So please join me in giving all three of our communications team a big round of applause. And Dr. Detloff, would you mind coming up and taking a picture, please? They did not want to haul all of those awards here, so we did not ask them to bring all of those. We wanted to give you an overview. Um, well, so we're, we're um, I'm going to go back here with Charlene. Jack, I won't touch any buttons, but I'm going to go in the back, or I'll get the camera. Hold on. All right, congratulations, guys. We won't make y'all go shake hands, but truly, thank you, guys. All right, we now uh, going on with our agenda. We need to approve our minutes from. February 14th, 2022, special finance pre-agenda meeting in February, that was February 14th, 2022, and February 22nd, 2022, our regular board meeting. Do I hear a motion to approve? Move for approval. Second. I have a motion to approve by Mr. Dendle and a second by Dr. Uh, Kingman and Lupita. Uh, <laughs> was it a dead heat? Okay. All right. So, uh, is there any other board discussion? Any public comment? If not, all in favor say aye. aye. All opposed say no. Motion passes. At this time, if anybody is here that wants to offer public comment for topics not on our agenda, as I mentioned in, in our opening comments when we first uh, opened the meeting, this is your time to come forward. I see no one coming forward, so we're going now to our reports. Uh, student enrollment report, Dr. McFarland. Sir, Mr. Parker and uh, Dr. Detloff, members of the board, your student enrollment report is from the 25th Monday of school, which was on Monday, February the 28th, 2022. Our student enrollment at the elementary level was 6,046 students. Middle school level, 3,170 students. And then at the high school level, 4,059 students for a total student count on the 25th Monday of school at 13,696. 
That represents at this time, in comparison to last year, a smaller number by 260 from the 25th Monday of last year. Question? I don't see any questions. Thank you, Dr. McFarland. All right, uh, campus review of evidence reports, and I uh, have uh, Dr. Detloff, you're going to handle that tonight. Yes, sir, Mr. Parker. Uh, I would uh, first want to thank our Board of Trustees for the opportunity for these evidence of learning uh, reports that are being uh, provided by our campus principals. Uh, they've been amazing uh, reports focusing on uh, student achievement uh, and all the ways that we're setting the conditions for success at the campus level. To introduce our uh, great principals this evening, I want to introduce our Director of Campus Academic Support, Cherie Braden. Early in my superintendency, I received a phone call uh, from TEA, the Texas Education Agency, uh, that wanted to highlight uh, Miss Braden in her principalship at Glenmore Elementary because Glenmore Elementary was one of the top five highest performing elementary schools in the state of Texas. Uh, so that was a few years ago and now we are extremely fortunate uh, to have uh, Cherie work uh, directly with our campuses uh, to really support them uh, in their uh, hunt for instructional prowess and student achievement. So I will turn it over to Ms. Braden, and she will make some great introductions for us. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Detloff. Um, it is a joy for me to talk a little bit about two of our wonderful principals here tonight. Um, being a principal myself, I know how hard the job can be, and uh, we have Kim Spurgers here tonight, and um, Kay Scott, they are going to talk a little bit about their campuses. Kay Scott has been principal at Santa Rita Elementary for the past 13 years, and they have been a very high-performing campus, and you'll get to see a lot of the information on data at her campus, as well as some of the really fun things they have going on for their kids, um, ways that they're pulling out smartnesses for for any student at their campus. And then Kim will also be sharing um, some things that they have going on at San Jacinto, data along with a lot of the fun activities that they have going on for kids. So I'll let them come up and share. Thank you, Cherie, and thank you, school board, for having us here tonight and Dr. Detloff, it's an honor. It has been an absolute blessing tonight to get to be a part of watching everything. Like I'm ready to go lift weights and <laughs> swim, maybe not do physics, um, but cheerleading and maybe do some kind of graphic thing. Like I'm excited. Like I was having visions of, you know, when they win the Super Bowl and the confetti and passing out trophies and rings. I'm like, so I'm going to try to calm my excitement down to be able to share with you about my campus. But wow, what a night already. So thank you for having me here tonight. I am the principal of San Jacinto Elementary. I do have to say that my most precious, wonderful uh, principal, assistant principal of instruction is here tonight, Stephanie Hochsteller. She wanted to be here to support me in this. I could not do what I do without her. And it's just been a wonderful um, year. And so we're going to share with you, or I'm going to share with you what, what we do at San Jacinto. I think what's something that's very unique about our campus is that we are 112 years old. So we broke ground in 1909 and opened our doors in, to students in 1910. And so we've been here serving the community in a, a very long time. You can see that picture of what San Jacinto used to look like and what it looks like now. I also brought in, you can kind of see over there on the table, this little board, my uh, daughter actually is a GT student, part of the TRICE program. Last year she made this because she's also a student at San Jacinto. So she went through the history of San Jacinto. So when you have a moment, I'm going to leave that here and I'll collect it sometime this week. But some great pictures and it takes you through the um, decades at San Jacinto and the things that have gone on at that school. So it's really, it's been um, a long time in our community. I meet people Probably every week I meet somebody that attended San Jacinto when they were a kid. And it's just, it's a fun place to work. And it's really exciting to just be part of the history, the rich history that San Jacinto has. 
So I want to tell you a little bit about who we are. So the students at San Jacinto are kind, eager to learn, street smart, genuine, and full of gratitude. The parents of San Jacinto love their children and have given us the great privilege of educating them. And the staff of San Jacinto have a motto that sums up how we feel about our students, which is hashtag we love kids. Two important things to know about San Jacinto as you're looking at our demographics is that we are a campus with three functional academic classrooms and most of our students are economically disadvantaged. Our three functional academic classrooms are self-contained special education classrooms with some of the sweetest, most special children in our city. The needs of these students may be medical, intellectual, autism, or genetic. Our staff is dedicated to meeting their needs, growing their skills, and maintaining strong relationships with their parents. Most years, San Jacinto sits close to 90% economically disadvantaged. Many of our students do not come prepared to start school and lack opportunities or experiences of students from higher economic backgrounds. Oftentimes, they do not have the resources, background knowledge, vocabulary, or language experiences that are needed to move at the pace of the Texas learning standards. This is not unique to San Jacinto. It's a challenge for any student that is economically disadvantaged. Our job is not to work miracles, but to add value to our students every day, week, and month. Throughout the entire year and all the years that we have them at San Jacinto, we focus on knowing where our students are and then growing them forward. One way we track knowing where students are and their growth is through map assessments in the area of reading, math, and science. Overall, we're making steady growth as a campus. We look at our over, overall growth data. That's important to kind of see that big picture. But we also look at individual student growth and determine first if they grew, then if they met our expected growth measure, and then we determine if they didn't do that, then why they didn't. And then we look at their intervention plan and make adjustments um, for that. So when you're looking at this data, it shows that we're hitting growth for all of our grade levels um, for third, fourth, and fifth, and in those subject areas. And so that is the big thing that we look at, because if you think about as students coming into our campus aren't prepared for like kindergarten. They may not know their name. They may not have had an experience of having crayons or markers or pencils or those kind of things. And so we um, have to take them where they are and move them forward. So we have to grow them. And we really look closely at their growth to make sure that the programming that we're using is making a difference um, for them academically. The next area that we look at overall for MAP is their academic performance. So MAP provides predictions, part of MAP, it's not all of MAP, but it can provide predict predictions of where students will likely uh, rate in regards to does not meet, approaches, meets, and masters for the third through fifth grade STAR test. This is a focus on overall academic academic achievement and not growth. At San Jacinto, our focus has to be on growth. When you look at this data, which is overall academic achievement, most students do not meet the typical grade level expectation of STAR. This would fall under domain one of state accountability for STAR. However, under domain two of state accountability, the focus is growth. And that has to be our focus because students who are economically disadvantaged do not come to school prepared for the rigor and the acceleration of the state standards. This does not mean that we lower our expectations. This does mean that my staff has to know their students' individual needs, provide scaffolding during instruction, provide small group instruction, and provide interventions as this, at the skill level to fill learning gaps in our students. 
one of the other things that we look at is M-Class. M-Class is a universal screener that measures the development of reading and math skills. I, was, I have a basketball analogy. Basketball's really big in our house right now because the Tar Heels won last night, right? So it's been really exciting. If you try to talk to me about basketball, I'll fake it. Um, I just try to repeat what my husband says. But we were excited last night because Tar Heels won. So a basketball analogy for M-Class versus NSGRA, because I know that you've heard about that from our campuses. So in basketball, the M class would be, we're looking at math skills and reading skills. So in basketball, it's kind of like, okay, can this kiddo do a layup? Can they, well, in my case, can they dribble? Can they dribble while they run with the ball? Um, can they pass the ball? So that would be M class, looking at those individual skills. And then NSGRA, which we'll look at in the next slide, looks at their overall reading level. So putting all those skills together to give you the reading level. So that's like when students play the actual basketball game and you're trying to determine, okay, is that a varsity kiddo or is that a JVA or for some of us a JVB or C team? <laughs> so that's, that's kind of the difference when you look at this um, reading data. So on our M class, when we get data like this, we start looking for trends. We make decisions at the universal level, which could be, um, which would be our core instruction in the classroom, what all students are getting. And then also at the supplemental and then strategic level. So we would call that tier one or tier two or tier three, which would be interventions. From there, we drill down to individual students and look specifically at their skill deficits and interventions. If there are not interventions in place for specific students or skills, we make adjustments to our intervention schedule. Our one interventionist and two instructional aides focus mainly on reading skills, and then our teachers then pull small groups for the math interventions, as well as making adjustments to their core math instruction. This is our NSGRA data, and the NSGRA stands for the Next Step in Guided Reading Assessment. It's Scholastic's four-step process for helping teachers pinpoint students' reading levels. Um, these are our beginning of the year to the middle of the year data, and then you can see observed growth. So you can see for some grade levels, we made pretty significant growth, and for some, we didn't. The great news is when you're looking at those middle of the year um, levels, these are the levels we hit, same levels, at the end of the year last year. So we're um, half a year then ahead of where we were last year. And last year, um, we went, we ended at like around 49% overall. And so we hit that now for this middle of the year um, level. So we're really excited about that. We know we have room to grow and it's about that progress and moving students forward. But we're excited that it's like, yes, we're already hitting our end of the year levels from last year right now, which is great because we all know that COVID hit us hard and we missed out on instruction and we missed out on some really important developmental milestones for our readers. And so it's really about catching students up to where they need to be as readers. Something that we did um, last year, really our last year work has flown into or flowed into this year's work. So last year in 2020 and 2021, we knew we needed to make some adjustments because you got to get a new game plan when you've missed a quarter of the school year and when you're at a campus that's more fragile. Um, our students, you know, it hurt them more academically to miss out on a quarter of the school year. So last year, what we started doing was mapping out each quarter of instruction and really pinpointing the most important learning standards that our teachers needed to move forward. We then put in intentional lesson planning in place with a template and teachers re began to really identify what's the learning target of each lesson, um, what's the, what 
what's the hook of the lesson? What's the activity of the lesson? What's the differentiation? And then how are they going to assess that? And then we also used, we have a physical data board with data cards and every kid has a card and it's got their picture on it and we're able to manipulate that card on our data board as well as a digital data board. Our, we took that work and moved it forward, continuing that work this year, but we also added, knowing that, okay, we've mapped out our curriculum, we're deep diving into our lesson plans. Now we need to look at what does that really look like in the classroom? Because you can do a lot of planning, but when the door is shut and it's that teacher and those kiddos, that's what really is the real work for all of us. That's where the impact is made. And so what we started doing was what I call a professional learning cycle, where we give professional learning to our staff on the ex instructional expectations that we, ex that we expect. And we do that in a way of teachers really sharing what they know about that particular expectation. And we started out simple, and it was learning targets, which is when you tell a kid, hey, this is what you're going to learn today. It's that simple, but it doesn't always happen in a classroom. And so we talked, we had our teachers talk about that. We watched videos on it. We set the expectation to give clarity. And then we said, okay, we're coming next week to see it. And then we're going to give you feedback on it. And so that's what we did. And, and so we did that with our walkthroughs. And that's what we've been doing all year. And then the way we give feedback, we've changed it this year. And it's made a huge, huge impact on our campus where we take pictures, so we have a Google form, we take pictures of these things that we're seeing, and then that day they get an email from us with those pictures, with our commentary on it, and then we're identifying grow and glow. And so we usually have a lot of glows, and then we, we try to pinpoint one thing, one area that they can grow in, one specific thing that they can really put in place right then to then change what they're doing, to up it to the next level. And then we also have coaching, because sometimes an email isn't enough. Sometimes you got to get face-to-face -face and sit down and talk with them. And um, we even do some role-playing. I get out there in the middle of the classroom and say, okay, this is what I would do, and this is how it would look like. And then um, they give feedback to us as well. And, and that's really the big thing that one of the big things that we're doing this year that's made a huge impact. The other thing that we're doing this year is instructional rounds. And so we do it differently each quarter. The first two quarters we started out with, we gathered a team of teachers and everyone participated in this, but we'd gather a team and we would have a focus and we would go into the classrooms, other teachers' classrooms. Um, and so they got to see their colleagues teaching because that's a great way to learn is when you see somebody else doing the same thing that you're doing. And we really realized how much they don't get to do, to do that. I get to see it all the time, so I've got great ideas, but I don't have a classroom. They have classrooms. They need to see each other teaching. And then um, for quarter three, what they did was they got to pick an hour and schedule an hour with another teacher and go into their classroom for an hour and then really use what they were seeing and be reflective on their own practice um, and make connections and then make plans for future things that they wanted to implement. And as quarter four is starting now, they'll be wrapping up instructional rounds in that same kind of way. So that's been really good, a good way to um, get them into classrooms and seeing what other teachers are doing. Those are really our big system work. We're doing other things, but those are our big, big impacts that we feel like are making a huge um, difference on our campus. Um, the next slide is about things that we're really proud of that have made a huge impact on our students, and it's our focus on social-emotional learning. Um, at two different levels, we're working at the tier one universal level. It's what all students get. We're teaching behavior we want to see in students, and we're using the capturing kids' hearts strategies. We have school-wide behavior expectations. We have carved out a time in the morning called Growing Strong Warriors, where all teachers at the same time are teaching students daily social skill lessons. And then we've also implemented what we call a brag board. So 
when you see a kid doing something that's safe, respectful, or responsible in class, you call it out. Hey, I like how you're doing that. That's really safe. Can you go sign the brag board? They love it. They eat that up. I mean, they're so excited, and it doesn't cost anything. It's just acknowledgement which is what we did here today at the school board, which excited me. I'm ready to go work out and learn some things. <laughs> and so that's what our kids are doing. They're getting their, um, we're bragging on them for being safe, respectful, and responsible. The supplemental work that we started this year, it's, it's for tier two. There's a system called check in, check out, um, where kids come in and they check in with somebody in the morning and they set a goal for the day based upon safe, respectful, responsible behavior. And then throughout the day, they get a feedback loop with their teacher. And then they also get a couple of times a week, they get social skills classes. So when we, we started doing this because we needed something, because we had some kids that were like, oh, they're going to hijack the day. It's scary. What are we going to do? And we were nervous because we already knew they were coming to us for this year starting. So we jumped into this. We'd learned about it through Emergent Tree. We, um, so we jumped into it, and we put it in place, and it's been phenomenal. Those kids are doing so good. So this is at that Tier 2 level. We don't have anyone at that Tier 3 level. They're working well. They they're really have integrated their behavior as just normal students in the classroom, and this thing is working for us because we calculated out and they get to hear about safe, respectful, responsible behavior. If they're there all week, which they are, right, they never miss, then it's 30 times a week they're hearing from somebody about safe, respectful, responsible behavior, which totally goes partners with the fact and our philosophy that we've bought into is that we're teaching students how to behave. They're learning how to behave. They're learning to be safe, respectful, responsible, and we're really seeing the results with that. The final um, information I'm going to share with you is just some other things that we've been excited about this year. The coaching support that we're offering our staff, our professional learning room. We have a room set up at San Jacinto that um, looks like a classroom for grown-ups where we have anchor charts on the walls and it's just that's where we do all our PLC meetings and PL meetings just to help us remember the things that are important to us and the work that we're moving forward. We also do a campus showcase through our weekly bulletin and claim it, name it, explain it at our staff meetings so that we're continually putting pictures or video in front of our teachers of the good work that they're doing to help um, just highlight it, and they're really they're really excited about it. It's been a lot of fun, and then of course our PLCs that we do weekly with our staff. For students, we have implemented an advanced academics club this semester. It's been a lot of fun for our third, fourth, fifth grade math teachers um, and students, and it's really focused on moving those kids forward that have um, approached, met, or mastered previously on STAR because they've got to maintain that standard and hit that growth level for this year um, so that we can hit our academic goals. It also gives them the opportunity to really get into deeper, um, harder, um, more advanced academics, and they love it. They love coming and being there. Um, we've also implemented Tuesday after school clubs um, sponsored by Southland Baptist Church. That's been really nice. It's things like um, games, just playing games with each other because our kids don't always have that opportunity. Um, yoga, uh, cooking, and a STEM class. And so they had a lot of fun with that. And it was really great to provide that for students that didn't necessarily qualify for that advanced academics club, and they loved being part of that. We also have put in a hokey pokey room where you can turn yourself around. I know Dr. Datloff got in there and played in there one day. We have a trampoline. We have, I think you got on the wobble board thing. So it's a place where when kids are really struggling to control themselves, they come in, and our counselor utilizes that space to help them uh, regain their composure, and it's been really great for our campus. And then, of course, the different interventions that we've put in place this year. So, is San Jacinto.
Are y'all asking questions or? <laughs> Sorry. I was just going to tell you thank you for coming to the meeting tonight and telling us about St. Jacinto. It's always great just to hear about our campuses. Um, but also a question I've been asking all the principals is just, you talked about your individual students and how you're getting to know those individual students. As a board, what can we do to give you the, any additional help at getting to know those individual students and making um, progress with those kids like you want to do and are doing? It's a great question. Um, I think, and you've probably heard this answer from a lot of principals, it's, um, you know, having the personnel that we need to be able to give them the interventions that we can give. You know, when you look at it from a mathematical standpoint, there's only so many time slots for interventions in a week. And when you've got X number of kids that need X number of minutes of interventions, and then you only have X number of time slots for interventions, it doesn't always match up. And it's about personnel. And I know that that's a challenge. I know it's a big challenge, not just for us, but it's for our state and our nation. Um, and so good luck for that. The other thing, honestly, <laughs> and I don't know that it's a school board thing that you can do. It could just be a state thing or a federal thing. But man, if we could get fully funded, full day, all day, um, three-year-old pre-K, four-year-old pre-K, the five-year-old pre-K. Yeah, so we're dreaming big, but those are I think, I think when I was in high school, we debated that topic. So it's been around for a long time. So yeah, it would be great if our kids could come a lot more prepared for that kindergarten curriculum because it goes fast. And several years back, I went and studied. Um, and this could be something too. We don't do a whole lot of PL on poverty. And our poverty percentage at many of our campuses is whoo, high. And sometimes people don't understand what 90% poverty looks like and what we, we go through on a day in, day out basis. It's fun and we love our babies, but whoo, it can be tough. And really understanding poverty, but I went to a training years ago in San Antonio on poverty and they talked about in order to really close those gaps and to make that difference, and you can, you can do it, but you have to, kids have to make a year and a half worth of growth every year for multiple years. And so there's, that's hard to do. And so figuring out what are those things that need to happen to get kids to make a year <laughs> and a half worth of growth when they don't really come to us fully equipped and they don't have the background knowledge. So I think that that's another area too, is that we can look at poverty and do we really understand it and what's out there, what can we put in place and are we putting in the right, put in place the right things to, to address that. I don't know if I should have said all that, but <laughs> there you go. I just have a comment. Uh, I'm too young to be a, I mean, too old to be a student at your campus, certainly too old to be a parent at your campus. I could be a grandparent at your campus, and your enthusiasm is infectious. So thank you for uh, your presentation and everything that you're doing for our students. Thank Great. You. Thank you. I love it. It is a joy there. My family is devoted to San Jacinto. My kiddo goes to school there, and it's important. We love our, we love our kids and our staff and our parents. It's a good place, and you're welcome anytime. Stop by, and we'll we'll show it to you. Miss Burgers, I know you've been at it for a while, but but uh, pre-pandemic and now we're post-pandemic. How many how many young kids did you see that came back to school that missed two years of work, uh, or even uh, kindergarten didn't 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 attend kindergarten or didn't attend first grade uh, because of the pandemic? Did, how many you know? Did you, how many more kids did you see in that position than you? Feels like see. a lot. I'm looking at Stephanie because we talk about it all the time. We're like, oh, oh, wait, they didn't go to kindergarten. Especially, we've got a handful of right, that missed first graders. That missed, technically missed years. Of right. We have, yes. Yeah. It is. It's huge. And um, you know, VLA was hard um, for those that quarter that we were out. But then any kid that was in VLA last year, that was really difficult, especially for our students that maybe. Um, didn't have what they needed 
um, background knowledge wise right. um, to be able to do it. it. It's a huge impact. We haven't sat down and put paper to pencil, but it's every day we're talking about, oh yeah, that kid, like, why is that kid struggling? We've got this, this, why aren't they making the progress? What's this, what's that? And oh yeah, they didn't go to kindergarten last year. They're now in first grade. So hey, if they were kindergartners, they're perfect. We don't really need to meet, be meeting because where their progress is, they're, it's good for kinder, but wow, they're going to be a second grader next year. And then our second graders move into third grade. So, Thanks for your work there, for sure. Uh, Ms. Burgers, thank you for being here. Just from tonight, shaking hands, I think you fit in best with the cheerleaders. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I tell you what, that's a tough act to follow with all the accolades and the presentations of awards this evening, but it's great for me to be here this evening. Um, good evening, Mr. Parker, Dr. Detloff, and members of the board. Again, it's a pleasure to be here, and we do appreciate the support. I have my instructional coach, Marie Marshall. She is like my right hand at Santa Rita Elementary, um, helping us pull off everything that we want to pull off. But I also want to touch base on um, the communications team. You know, you met the trio earlier. I'd call them the Three Musketeers. And they help us tremendously um, support all of the initiatives that we do at our campus. They take time out of their schedules to come meet with us personally and say, how can we help you? What are some things that you are doing? And how, what do we need to do to move the work? So thank you, communications team, for, for doing that for us. It's huge. Another thing that I want to say is about the Energy Start team. Um, Mr. Rump and Mr. Van Hooser, amazing men. Um, Mr. Van Hooser is on speed dial. Um, you know, teachers are like emailing and going, it is so hot in my room. Can you help me? Mr. Van Hooser, I sent him a text and instantaneously the temperatures adjusted and I'm telling you what, that makes a big impact in a classroom because the teachers are like, oh my gosh, thank you. So controlling the environment is huge as well. But there are so many entities within SAISD that make us successful at our campus. So I'm gonna share a little bit about Santa Rita Elementary. Um, our mission at Santa Rita is to provide a safe learning environment in which students receive essential building blocks to grow and reach their individual potential. At Santa Rita, our motto is Stronger Together. Here we have two students sharing a couple of characteristics that support being a Santa Rita Falcon. The seven habits of a highly effective falcon come from a spinoff of Stephen Covey's book, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. Hallie, what do you think it means to be a Santa Rita Falcon? Well, take these seven sides in the hall as an example. My favorite one is always say please and thank you. It really means a lot to people. And I bet your parents always want you to say it. Vivi, what do you think it means to be a Santa Rita Falcon? Well, I think the seven signs are a great example to represent what being a Santa Rita Falcon is. Well, I love the kindness is contagious sign because when you're kind to someone, it spreads like all around, like the coronavirus. That's what Santa Rita is all about. Bye! That was just a snippet of the seven habits of a highly effective falcon. Santa Rita is a neighborhood school and a GT magnet campus. We serve approximately 355 students. Approximately 14% of our population is gifted and talented. 43% of our population is economically disadvantaged. And 21% is special education. We have approximately 39 staff members. And all of these positions are vital to the success of what we do every day for our students. Some of the systems we have in place at Santa Rita include the seven pillars of an effective school. We have seven pillars of success that support what we do in our district on a regular basis. We have this display in our hallway to remind us of the daily routines that help us educate and keep our students and staff safe. Professional learning communities, also known as PLCs. We meet weekly to provide time for our teachers to be intentional with planning and looking at the strengths and weaknesses of all of our students. Tiered Instruction and MTSS, our interventionist Jessica Bowling and our instructional aide Christina Schneider support students with small group instruction targeting deficits and closing learning gaps. We discuss these students every three weeks during PLCs and make adjustments to meet needs. We use current resources purchased by the curriculum and instruction department. Jessica is doing do the math 
and Christina is using encoding and decoding activities, and we also use a leveled literacy intervention, also known as LLI. Core values of a Santa Rita Falcon. Our three core values are the same as Ms. Berger's at San Jacinto. They are safe, respectful, and responsible. This idea allows the class to be a cohesive in their actions and make proper choices to be successful in the classroom. Students sign a brag board when they are caught demonstrating these values, and these strategies are part of a bigger picture supporting behaviors district-wide. Our next steps in guided reading assessments, also known as NSGRA, our data is not exactly where we would like for it to be. Our campus goal is usually 85% or higher, and this year we adjusted this goal due to the effects of COVID. We are changing how we provide core instruction and support that instruction with many lessons in phonics and phonemic awareness to support the varied reading abilities. And as Ms. Spurger shared with the COVID pandemic, it's been hard to close those gaps because our kindergarten students missed their first year in kindergarten as a normal year. And so they're coming back now as second graders for their first full normal year. The next data that we're gonna look at is our measure of academic progress or MAPS data for third, fourth, and fifth grade. The graph shows that we're making progress in math and reading. Math is on the top and reading is on the bottom. Currently, we are showing approximately 84% of our students as projected to do well on STAR math, and approximately 85% of our students are projected to do well on STAR reading. Teachers are intentional during multi-tiered support system or MTSS time to close gaps in the subcategories for these subjects. And Ms. Spurger's expanded upon that, you know, like how they do that at San Jacinto. There's just not enough time in the day to meet the needs of all students. So any extra time or personnel is always welcomed. Next, we talk about our MAPS data for science. We're showing approximately 88% of our students should be successful on the STAR, which is represented by the areas in blue, green, and yellow. We contribute this success to small group instruction and intervention, STEM scopes, hands-on experiences in the classroom that include labs, along with the opportunity to send, star, to send our students to STAR base, the relationship that we have with Goodfellow Air Force Base. M-Class is a new program that we are using this year. This program supports the foundation of math skills and assesses our students sharing the skills they need to become better mathematicians. This program encourages fluency and automaticity, automaticity with math skills. M-Class Reading took place of iStation this year. This program supports the foundation of phonics and phonological awareness and assesses our students on the basic skills of, reading, of the reading process. We're still learning this program and navigating the supports to close the gaps in kinder through second grade. And we've been looking at data to be intentional here, and we also went to the extent to create teacher skill traits to support our intervention times. We also have digital data walls and goal setting at Santa Rita. I meet with all students in third through fifth grade to discuss progress throughout the year. These conversations allow students to have input on their own learning and build relationships fostering growth. All of our teachers have digital data walls where individual students are tracked. Teachers also use these data tracking sheets for student conferences. Some of the things we're working on at Santa Rita, first being teak driven instruction. Ms. Berger's talked about this as well. We're using the Texas Essential Knowledge and Skills Resource System to support planning and designing of lessons. Our focus is being intentional with the TEAK, teaching the verb, the content, and the vocabulary within the TEAK so we can teach with depth and complexity for the varied levels of all of our students. Next, we have data analysis of unit assessments. We look at data in PLC and make adjustments to our lessons to close gaps. We currently use Eduphoria to create tests and gather this data. Student engagement, we're reflective of the design qualities from the Schletke Center and host roundtables with students, asking them how they like to learn concepts and embed those in their learning. Writing, we have really focused on writing this year, encouraging students to write encompasses so many skills that we look for it to be embedded in all subject areas. So if you happen to step foot on, a, on our campus, you'll see a lot of writing hanging in the halls. 
There's also personal reflective notes given by myself or teachers on the writing process to support strengths and pose questions of how to further their thinking and expand their writing skills. Some of the points of pride at Santa Rita, each quarter we host a Principal Pals ceremony. We recognize students for demonstrating the qualities of a Santa Rita Falcon, those qualities being the seven habits of a highly effective Falcon and the three core values mentioned at the beginning of the presentation. Teachers choose a boy or a girl from their class each quarter and write a couple of paragraphs sharing how the student made a difference in their classroom. It's not academically related at all. Parents are invited and we share these great things with them and present the students with, with a certificate and serve punch and cookies. Santa Rita Band Club, students work with Mr. Ochoa to learn and create music and I'm telling you this, this club gets pretty crazy at times. Another point of pride, Santa Rita is a GT magnet campus and hosts ZSpace, which is an augmented reality software that supports students in various areas such as reading, math, and science. Our students are currently using this software for classroom projects for the Texas Research Institute of Young Scholars or TRIES projects that will be presented in April. These TRIES projects are supported by community mentors and are also judged by the community and high school students from Central and Lakeview. Kevin Doherty from ZSpace has supported this integration along with Tiffany Hebner, Jennifer Feck, and Brandon Lagon. Students also presented ZSpace to the Rotary Club and led members through experiences with the software. They had so much fun, and here's a snippet of the visit. Let me just tell you, those third and fourth grade students came back thinking they knew it all. It was, it was fun. <laughs> Another point of pride is our journalism club. I kind of like everything about it, but my favorite part, most of all, is like my job, my role, like what I get to do, and writing, which is really fun with my partners, and I just really like them. I like whenever we're done with a, a newspaper that we always choose a bunch of ideas, and then everybody chooses one or two. Like how everyone is like so welcome with each other, and they just like, it's like so warming, and like I'm, I'm, I've looked forward all week to going to the two clubs. That it's like we act like this is so real because it is to us. It matters to us. We have a deadline. We're like any normal uh, journalism business. We just, we're just doing it for a smaller community, and I just love it. I like writing the articles and researching about the topics that I'm writing about. Hey. Y'all ready? Yeah. Yes. Okay, here you go. Yeah. Did you print the newspaper? <gasps> yeah. 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 yeah! I need to see the newspaper. Wait, can I Where is my hero? Oh, this is mine! I need to wait for my parents. Me too! Wait, can we take them home? Yeah, What's on the back? They are yours to keep. Yeah. Yeah. As you can tell, that was a secret reveal, and they were really excited. And again, Whitney was very instrumental in helping us get, oh, Molly was very instrumental in, it's a team effort. They're over there arguing, so I'm going to settle it and represent both of them and share that we really couldn't do it without the communications team. Um, they do so many things behind the scenes that help us. Um, the, journalism, the journalism club has been an amazing ad adventure, and it was really interesting to watch the video and how they took ownership of their work. So you all got a sample of what um, the Santa Rita Times is all about. And I reached out to um, Whitney, and Molly doesn't know this because she wasn't standing there, but we need um, to take the second um, draft to print. And so you guys can't let me down 
because we set the bar high. <laughs> yes, so I guess we'll be making a call or if I need to, I'm happy to take lunch or dessert to Livestock Weekly. <laughs> <laughs> Another club at Santa Rita is our STEAM lab. Our library aide, Brenda Nall, double duties as our STEAM teacher. She rotates these duties every three weeks to support choices for our students. The students in the picture are enjoying circuitry. During class time, these topics are revisited and the older students are given tasks to complete, such as creating a certain type of circuit and being able to explain it and demonstrate it to their classmates. The STEAM Lab provides various opportunities for students to choose from, from such as Strawbies, Legos, Blocks, Art, Ozobots, and much more. Another point of pride at Santa Rita is our Fine Arts Academy. Each year we host this academy where, in, where we invite local artists from the community. Um, in the past, we have hosted Elena Kent, Julie Raymond, and Gabriel Lucky, to name a few. We ask them to share their talents with our students and have them replicate a piece of artwork. We love hearing their stories and how they have nurtured their passion of art. It's always inspiring to hear how they have incorporated their passions and juggled everyday life. We also have our cheer club, which supports our campus rallies. They share various cheers during those rallies, and they are also given leadership roles for announcing students during those rallies as well. We also incorporate theater arts. We host plays throughout the year for those interested in the arts. This year, we hosted uh, Merry Christmas, Charlie Brown. We're gonna host the Texas play, a play on the 13 colonies, and Aladdin. So if you're hanging out in, in the Santa Rita neighborhood in May, stop by, you just might catch one of those. Um, we always invite the school board to visit our campus. Our doors are open, as you know, five days a week from 7.30 to basically four. <laughs> and as all campuses in the district, we appreciate the time and support that each one of you give to make these things possible for our students. We are thankful for the support that you give us and the support that supports the why, which is student success. So again, thank you for all that you all do because we wouldn't be as successful without all of you. Are there any questions? Thank you, Ms. Scott. Any questions, board? I want to know if there's a schedule of plays that we can come see. <laughs> okay, I can email you, awesome, and we you. will get you the times in the evenings. They're Agreed. after hours, so there shouldn't be any excuses. That'd be awesome. Thank you. Yeah, if you, Becky, if you'll get those and send it to the board, there would be your good contact. She can get it all to us. Thank you. Okay, perfect. Ms. Scott, I'm a, thank you again for coming and presenting to us. I'm going to ask you the same question because I've asked it to everyone, so I can't, you're, the, you're the last elementary school, so I can't not ask it to you. So um, what is there anything as a board that we can give your campus and your teachers to help you all continue to um, progress with our students from a board level? Absolutely. And I'm just going to piggyback on what Ms. Berger said, staff. I mean, at Santa Rita, our demographics are a little bit different than San Jacinto. So I totally understand that. But when you can lower the student-teacher ratio or provide more time for students to get intervention to close those gaps during the school day, that's huge. Another one I'd like for you to give us, and I don't know how in the world any of you can pull this off, is time. How do we squeeze more time in the school day? Our teachers are very passionate about what they do, and they take work home with them in the evenings, and they spend countless hours making decisions to impact the, the lives of the students they serve each day. So one thing that you could do is just drop by my campus, go into a classroom, and say thank you for all this. Are there any other questions? Thank you again for being here and a great presentation. Thank you. I we appreciate, appreciate it. appreciate both of you for all you do as we do all our principals. It's a, you have a tough, tough job and tough circumstances, and you're doing a great job, and we're proud of all of you. Thank you. All right, we're going to take a quick break and uh, uh, come back in a few minutes, so let's take five minutes. All right, let's go back on. Uh, back, I'm, I'm used to the legal term. We're back on the record, all right? That is, uh, yeah, that's right. Let's continue on. Dr. Detloff, you're going to uh, help us with our taper report.
Yes, sir. A well-timed uh, intermission, Mr. Parker. Uh, members of the board, Mr. Parker, good evening. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to uh, present our taper report to you this evening. Texas school districts on a yearly basis are required to report district performance data, including financial information, district and campus student academic data, demographic summaries, and any violent or criminal incidents. Admittedly, tonight's report will not be nearly as mesmerizing as Jason Henry's management oversight report that he provided last week at our pre-agenda. I'm hesitant to follow a presentation that lived at the intersection of philosophy, art, and purchasing. <laughs> it was well done and exemplifies uh, that our leaders uh, model the attributes of our learner and educator profile in their daily work. The TAPER report, or Texas Academic Performance Report, was formerly known as the Academic Excellence Indicator System, or AEIS, that many of us were accustomed to in the past. The actual report encompasses hundreds of pages, and you can see the original document here. These documents were provided to our team of eight at our pre-agenda meeting, uh, which included a jump drive and a hard copy that I just uh, showed. The TAPER report also embeds specific board goals as required by House Bill 3. What makes this year's report unique is that we now have a more comprehensive understanding of student data at the campus level due to our evidence of learning presentations by our campus principals. We all heard the detailed presentation just moments ago from Kim and Kay. I want to highlight and thank the board for their guidance in adding this additional layer of student data reporting where we can now drill down and see the incredible efforts that are made by our classroom teachers and campus principals towards campus and student success. In SEISD, we continue to be focused on academic growth and advancing each student's individual learning. The past two years have provided new obstacles and opportunities, both on the home front and at the schoolhouse with COVID. We continue to be evidence-informed and people-driven, both in students and staff, as we adapt to a changing educational landscape. The TAPER report provides historical information that is important it's important for us to review to look at yearly trends in student progress and then potentially reallocate resources based on those trends. However, it is rearview mirror data and focused on performance that is a year old. Thanks to the resources our board team have placed at the campus level, you heard many of those resources earlier tonight, MAP, the measurement of academic progress, NSGRA, next steps to guided reading assessment, coupled with the individual academic mentoring of teachers and administrators through our educational partners. We now have current student data that is formative, happening on a monthly basis. And this uh, better helps us identify individual student learning needs. This helps us make instructional decisions in real time and adjust according to student need, not simply waiting on a yearly assessment to adapt classroom teaching. Let us also not forget there is a heartbeat behind each of these data points in this document, and a teacher that is committed to the success of students. Both assessment systems, STAR and our formative assessments mentioned earlier, are important in our pursuit of excellence. I'll now take a few minutes to review the information on our slide deck. Texas Education Code uh, requires each district, as I mentioned, uh, and their Board of Trustees to hold a public hearing and publish an annual report that includes the enclosed information, House Bill 3 goals, uh, financial data, special education data, campus performance goals and objectives, uh, violent criminal incidents, um, and then uh, performance in post-secondary uh, institutions and college credits. March 13th, as we know, the Governor Abbott declared a state of disaster for all counties in Texas. So uh, after spring break in SAISD for the remainder of April and May, uh, we were at home and did not have school. Uh, and uh, you as a board team asked those critical questions as well of our campus leaders uh, about students that simply missed an entire grade level uh, due to the pandemic. Uh, thus, the governor waived the STAR testing requirements for the 1920 school year and ordered all schools temporarily closed. Uh, state was declared a state of disaster for the 1920 school year. Because student performance is an indicator in the state accreditation system, 
basically 30% or a third uh, component of our state uh, star testing and accountability system uh, was not uh, there uh, for us to make those comparisons to student growth. So they suspended the entire system uh, in year year that we in that this year get our final report August. Uh, due to TEA action, all districts and campuses the label of not rated declared state of disaster. And as a reminder, uh, San Angelo ISD received a rating of B at the last full assessment uh, on the A through F rating. We were an 85 A solid rating. That was the last grade uh, uh, that was created. Uh, size here you can see again. Remember, this data is a uh, previous, it's historical information. Now, last year, uh, we uh, are down about 5% in student enrollment. We talked about student enrollment across the state being about a 4% deficit. Uh, currently, in SAISD, we're operating at about 5% deficit. Bilingual education, 5%. Career and technical education, 75%. We also heard the uh, young man that was honored of our swimmers, uh, Roxanne Fentress, our director, her son this evening. Nice to recognize. Incredible job. Talented education, 504. There, dyslexia. Uh, again, last year, uh, percent economically disadvantaged was 55 uh, percent. Uh, Dr. Skelton uh, and his staff has, have done a magnificent job of really culling that data. Uh, and currently, this year, we're at about 63 uh, percent. The terminology I used under resource uh, or economically disadvantaged is labeled by the state uh, of our foster care, you can see there the military connected. Uh, again, a reminder on our military connected students, there's about uh, 900 families that are connected to Goodfellow Air Force. 50% of our uh, population is Attendance, uh, you can see uh, statewide and district wide those drops that are taking place across public schools. Uh, George, is this correct that we're about maybe at 92 percent right now? So, uh, again, we've dropped from that uh, previous uh, 1920 rate of 98 percent, 92 percent. That's consistent with district Texas. In fact, it may actually be favorable in attendance. Dropout rate uh, continues to was graduation rate, 92 percent. And a college career military readiness is the CCMR and 77 percent. I want to highlight this slide. Um, the college career mi military readiness, this really focuses on students that are ready for a career post-secondary in a post-secondary environment. So students that are choosing higher ed, military, the workforce, additional certifications, uh, and this is a highlight of our district. When kids are in our system, from K-12, when they are in our system, our classroom teachers and campus leaders do a magnificent job of getting them ready for the real world. And this data indicates that, uh, as you can see, uh, basically what's that, 14 percentage points um, higher than the state average. So when kids are in our system, uh, they do well. College ready, ready graduates, uh, you can see the district, state, dual credit courses. Uh, many of us have had our own students uh, and our, our own family members graduate from the SAISD system, uh, my two daughters included, uh, and with dual credit uh, hours uh, is also just a, provides a, uh, um, certainly a fiscal boost for the family as uh, your pay is reduced for those uh, college tuition credits because your students are arriving to uh, Institute of Higher Ed with more credits. Oh, sure. Um, so as I mentioned, the dual credit courses are uh, uh, just a viable option for our students uh, to receive those uh, additional credits as they move forward into uh, Institute of Higher Ed. 
2019 graduates uh, enrolled in institutions of higher ed. We are a little bit behind the state average there. Uh, and remember, this data is two-year-old data uh, when you look at uh, financial information. Much of the tapered report. And then our career tech students earning college ed, here you can, uh, college credit, you can see some of those statistics there, and college hours. And total students, college credit hours, 13,000 hours that are earned in our district. Uh, board goals, HB3, House Bill 3. Uh, as you may remember in the past uh, legislative session, House Bill 3 indicated that your district needed some uh, early childhood goals uh, and literacy goals. So here we have goals that we've uh, kind of recalibrated from previous years. Uh, the percent of third grade students that score meets grade level or above on star reading will increase from 36% to 60% by June 2025. Um, you, Kim and uh, Kay mentioned uh, certainly in campuses with uh, significant under-resourced numbers. So we have probably four campuses in SAISD that are hovering around 90% economically disadvantaged. Um, we heard this evening that uh, basically it takes, you need that year and a half of growth to keep them at a, a steady pace. So we believe this three-year window uh, will greatly enhance our opportunity to do that as we're making progress now with student growth uh, in that area of literacy. Early childhood math board outcome, uh, star math will increase from 41% to 65% by August 2025. And then we mentioned college career military readiness. Uh, that percent of graduates that meet that criteria will increase from 40% to 60% by 2020. Some points of pride in our school district uh, continue to be our bilingual programs, uh, which we have two bilingual programs now at Bradford and Glenmore. Uh, I have been in those programs, both of them in the last uh, month. Uh, and I can tell you great things are happening. And in fact, uh, one of the principals, principals recently shared that on uh, her student data, reading information, the students in the bilingual classroom uh, were doubling the pace of our students in a typical classroom in the area of literacy. So uh, our bilingual programs are working for us, uh, and, and we're excited about that opportunity and continue that expansion. All day pre-kindergarten, currently we have seven elementary schools with all day pre-K. Um, we've redesigned our special ed program to meet uh, some of those behavioral needs that are specific uh, to students um, through our Inspire program. We're increasing opportunities for students to participate in PSAT, uh, SAT, and ACT. And as a reminder for our constituents and audience and board team, um, our uh, SAT and ACT scores, specifically SAT scores, dipped a little bit but that's uh, this year, but that's because for the first time in the history of SAISD, we went to a universal SAT program, which means every single student takes the SAT on campus. Previously, uh, it was uh, mainly families that uh, wanted to provide that opportunity for their child, perhaps on a Saturday morning, uh, to make arrangements and pay the fee uh, to test uh, with the SAT uh, or ACT. Um, now all of our students uh, at Central and Lakeview have that opportunity. Thus, the overall uh, score uh, seems to go down, but the doors of opportunity are open for our students, uh, which includes a more uh, opportunity for access into higher ed institutions. Uh, STEM curriculum provided at elementary and middle schools. Uh, and then, of course, the extracurricular, athletic extracurricular activities. And uh, as we all know, my stump speech, kids that are involved in speech, debate, cheerleading, soccer, uh, journalism, uh, key club, or any extracurricular activities in athletics, their graduation rates are higher, their attendance rates are higher, uh, and they are certainly have the opportunity to be productive citizens. Uh, not to mention, their uh, grade point averages are higher as well. And then uh, we continue to work on our community-based accountability system. In fact, right now, uh, as you have noticed this evening, uh, three of our uh, key district leaders are at the Texas Assessment uh, Performance Consortium uh, helping develop the accountability system of the future in Texas. So uh, three leaders uh, uh, were invited uh, to do that um, from SAISD, and they are currently in Austin right now helping develop that and implement, implementing and utilizing panorama data, 
uh, our learning management system that we lifted up uh, during the pandemic, Schoology, um, universal breakfast district-wide. So all students in SAISD have the opportunity uh, for that universal free breakfast. And then partnership with Angelo State University, Howard College, um, and then our uh, great partnership with the Shannon Medical Community as well, Shannon Medicine. Those are just points of pride. Uh, information regarding the annual taper report presentation can be found at the Texas Education website uh, and our own website, saisd.org. Uh, and that concludes our presentation this evening. Uh, I also have with me uh, some of our uh, teammates, uh, and we'll be happy to uh, respond to any uh, questions you may have around uh, paper report or uh, our academic presentations this evening. Carl, go ahead. No, go ahead. I was going to say, Carl, just um, to add to what you said about SAT and ACT, those tests are also free for students, correct? Yes, sir. Yeah, so we're not charging students, even though we're giving that universally. Uh, that's a district cost, so the parents are benefiting by uh, us doing that for them. Did you say <clears throat> here where it says in 2021, 2020-2021, uh, our percent of economically disadvantaged was 55.4% that we're now, uh, for this year, we've been putting up uh, research in that. It's a higher rate now? Yes, sir. It's 63% now. Okay. And that will also, Mr. Parker, go into our formula uh, for our STAR scores as well. Does that mean our Get me for not talking into the mic. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir, I would assume that that would be. Uh -huh. Carl, I don't know if this is a question for you or Sherry. Or Fer I don't know who has this information, but I know we weren't scored last year. But as far as our formative internal assessments, when we look at our data that we're getting from the state, do they appear to be coming in alignment? So when we're seeing growth on our internal map, et cetera, is that going to translate into growth on the state assessments? Do we know that? Do we have enough data? So I will let uh, Ms. Braden respond to that, uh, at least to from an elementary perspective, just to see, uh, based on our internal uh, map data at the elementary level, uh, how we compare to uh, previous uh, individual reports that were issued, but not, not letter grades. So I can tell you without having the data in front of me, um, we are monitoring, we did beginning of the year and middle of the year map assessments, and we are making growth, but we are not where we were this time in 2019. But we are making gains. So, Dr. Kingman, to answer your question, having that growth component will benefit us tremendously because we didn't have that before, especially with those um, lower socioeconomic campuses. And last year with the numbers, how they came in, it was out of line and it does impact their comparison schools. So it has a major impact on um, the other schools that are used in their data sets. So going back to give Dr. Skelton and his team accolades for the work they did to get it back in line with where they had been will be um, very beneficial so that they're rated more appropriately. And that concludes our presentation this evening. <laughs> and we'll be happy to respond if you uh, think of additional questions. Thank you, Dr. Detloff. <clears throat> okay, we'll move on with our uh, agenda. We have our consent items. Uh, we have consent items A through D. A, donations. B, consider approval of quarterly investment report ending February 28, 2022. 
C, consider TASB risk management fund interlocal participation. And D, consider superintendent's recommendations for 2022-2023 administrator's contracts. Um, I hear a motion to approve our consent items A through D. Yeah, we, we shouldn't have D because we don't have anybody to approve for contracts, correct? Oh, so that's for that's so, for next year. Yeah, but we don't have any approved for next year. So we. This is administrator. This is administrator. Oh, I'm sorry. Contract. Correct. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So it is A through D. Yeah. yeah please approve those. There's a, there's a bunch <laughs> that you want to approve. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thanks. I'll make that motion to approve A through D. All right, so we've had a motion by Mr. Lehman and a second by Mr. Gallegos to approve consent items A through D. Is there any other board discussion? Is there any public comment? If not, all in favor say aye. All opposed say no. Motion passes. Uh, consider bills, accounts, and financial statements for February 2022. Just as a reminder to our public audience, the uh, bills, accounts, and financial statements for February of 2022 were all um, discussed at our pre-agenda meeting and all of those reports including our checkbook are available on the San Angel ISD webpage under financial transparency. I guess with that I'll make a motion that we approve <laughs> the bills with the accounts and financial statements. All right we have a motion by Dr. Kingman and a second by Mr. Dindle to Approve the agenda item, consider bills, accounts, and financial statements for February 2022. Is there any other board discussion? Is there any, other, is there any public comment? If not, I'll call the vote. All in favor say aye. aye. All opposed say no. Motion passes. Next is consider pro proposed amendment for district official budget for general fund. We have a motion to approve. Well, I'll make the motion then. Uh, <laughs> uh, I move that we consider the proposed amendment for district official budget for the general fund. Is there a second? Second. There's a second by Mr. Dindle. Is there any other board discussion? Is there any public comment? Just to note, Mr. Parker, that uh, we are just moving money around in, in our function codes, uh, but our budget results in no monetary difference. All right, thank you. Is there any public comment on this agenda item? If not all in favor say aye. aye. All opposed say no. The motion passes. Well, we've got cheerleaders over here. I can see they've got all their routines down. So. <laughs> all right have everything set up now. I'll turn it back over to Dr. Detloff to consider board goals. Mr. Parker, members of the board, apparently hiding behind the uh, poster board is not conducive to our learner profile here. So we will, uh, I am very uh, delighted to provide uh, our new board goals this evening uh, to recommend for adoption. District planning is one of the most important tasks a school board can perform. Developing a vision and adopting goals for the district sets the course and keeps the district moving in a positive direction. Our Board of Trustees, in conjunction with our district leadership team, has gone to great measure to create board goals that serve as a lighthouse for our uh, district to pursue excellence in all endeavors. Especially in recent times of turbulence and challenge the last 24 months due, due to a pandemic and increasing gaps in learning, these goals will help provide a focal point and an expectation for our community, students, districts, and families. A true north, if you will. Our board was committed and thoughtful as they developed these board goals. Working with facilitators and thought partners inside and outside of our organization to provide clarity, this important endeavor took place over an eight-month period meeting multiple times to reassess and make certain the goals are clear, meaningful, and provide guidance to our school district and constituents. Action steps were also developed during this time period and will be embedded as internal documents in district and campus improvement plans and administrative guidelines. 
These action steps are fluid and will adjust on more of a frequent basis. I'll provide examples in the next slides. As you can see, the, the board goals of student engagement. Um, basically, student engagement is centered around really multiple prongs. We've got uh, our curriculum and instruction department with our actual district curriculum. Uh, we have our TEKS resource system, uh, which is shown to uh, provide that academic improvement, uh, not only on the taper report that we just did, uh, but in literacy and numeracy as well. We have our MAP and NSGRA assessments, which uh, measurement of academic academic progress and next steps to guided reading assessments. We have embedded academic coaching, innovative and research-based practices, and our reading academies that are all components of student engagement. I want to provide one quick example, and I'm going to step away. So uh, this is just an in incredible uh, reminder of why student engagement is so critical uh, now as we look at, at schools and innovation in the 21st century. Uh, if, as we talk about student engagement, I was in Mrs. Norman's class at McGill Elementary uh, this week, and in Mrs. Norman's class, uh, the students in her third grade class developed a book of poetry uh, entitled, Tell Me I'm Clever. And if you'll notice, they even have an ISBN number on the back because this book is available on Amazon. Now, what makes this lesson extremely engaging is when I was in here, not only is it a book of poetry created by the students, but in real time, Mrs. Norman, the teacher, is pulling up the Amazon.com chart for book sales on their ISBN number. So they, in real time, the students are looking at their number of sales that they've created over time. And in fact, while we were viewing the screen, there was an additional ding, and they just sold another book uh, while we were there. So you know, if you think about an all-encompassing education, they were developing a marketing plan for this text. They were adding up the, uh, the amount raised uh, and the amount uh, that were generated by each sale of the book. So they had maybe $4.17 they earned last week, $8.19 this week. So they, only, they not only had their marketing plan uh, and looking at charts and graphs, but they also had a, a numerical process in mathematics uh, with addition and subtraction. And the real life example of the publisher is going to take 60% of this. Uh, Amazon's going to take uh, maybe 30%, and the author may get 10%. Um, so it's just an incredible way uh, that was real time uh, to, sh to show that, that great example of student engagement. So I think as we look at classrooms of the future, uh, I always say we really, our classrooms need to look more like Starbucks than a factory. Uh, and I think uh, we are creating those uh, engaging spaces to do that. Uh, and we know that kids, we've heard it this evening in our presentation, uh, want to be engaged uh, to really uh, learn in a, in a 21st century uh, world and marketplace. So student engagement is one of our critical uh, board goals. Culture and communication is a second goal. Uh, we know that it takes a community to help each other succeed in life. Our joint partnerships with multiple systems and city leadership showed this to really be true the last 24 months. ASU, Goodfellow, Howard College, the city, county, medical community, and others held hands through the pandemic and helped our city thrive. So how do we continue to use these partnerships to enhance and open up doors of opportunity for our students? Uh, another great example is SME Prime, uh, that partnership with Ethicon, uh, Principal LED, and others in our city provide real life certifications for our kids when they come out into the workforce. So, Culture, communication, all of these are embedded in creating those partnerships that, again, open up doors of opportunity uh, for our students. Innovative learning spaces. Uh, some terrific examples of uh, doing incredible things exist in SEISD. Uh, we have so many classrooms, uh, even uh, 
portable buildings that are really uh, from antiquity, um, that the principals are doing great job recreating that space uh, to provide an engaging learning environment. However, uh, at some point in time, our district has multiple aging facilities. We heard this evening uh, that San Jacinto Elementary is 113 years old. At some point in time, we will, as a community, will have to come together uh, and uh, look at creative solutions uh, to adapt our aging facilities. Uh, there are plumbing needs, uh, there are safety and security needs, uh, structural needs, um, and currently we also uh, are employing uh, an architectural firm uh, to provide our Board of Trustees and our leadership team a uh, valid and current assessment of our facilities uh, so that we can make a proactive plan moving forward into the future. So in this, these innovative learning spaces are critical. So how do we either adapt our current spaces, which we have proof that that is happening now, or how do we build, restructure, uh, and recalibrate some of our aging facilities that are tired? Uh, how, do we, how do we move these tired facilities to uh, facilities of innovation uh, that really benefit our, our students? So these are really, you know, to me, you can take these three goals and put them on the mantle. Uh, so these are the centerpiece of what we do, and already uh, we've utilized these uh, board goals um, in our professional learning opportunities, in our conversations with staff, uh, in even um, our evaluations with uh, principals and leaders uh, throughout our school system. So these three uh, board goals um, really kind of provide us the, uh, the lighthouse uh, to navigate these uh, turbulent waters that we've experienced um, these last 24 months, and they are simply energizing uh, and provide us that motivation to do so. So goal setting and planning, again, provide a guidepost and serve as a reminder for our organization or system, how do we stay on course? The, the focus is on our true north. Much like a teacher continually refers to their posted teaching and learning objective, or an employee focuses on their personal health and wellness by establishing nutrition and fitness goals, goals help motivate and inspire employees, set direction for leaders, and evaluate performance. The administration recommends approval of our three new board goals as presented. Thank you, Dr. Detloff. Anyone have questions? We've all, uh, as he said, worked on these goals for several months, but it is time that we need to implement those. So, yes, Lanny? Sure, I'll make a motion that we um, approve the um, board goals as worked on by our administrative team as well as our board team members. And I'll second that. All right, so we have a motion by Mr. Lehman, a second by Mr. Parker, that we approve uh, the, bo the board goals as presented by Dr. Detloff. Is there any other board discussion? Is there anyone that has public comment? If not, all in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed say no. Motion passes. That includes everything on our agenda except uh, where we consider superintendent evaluation contract and salary, and we will go into executive session under uh, the Texas Government Code Section 551.074, personnel matters, to discuss that. And so we're going to take a break and do that, and we'll be back in some time. <laughs> All right, we're back on the record. Uh, board team is back. We have a quorum. We took no action. We took no votes. Uh, and I don't think we have anything else we need to discuss tonight, so we're going to adjourn the meeting. Thank you. <laughs>